wasn't an addict and he didn't want to die. And that's something that kills me. He didn't want to die. Hmm. But he and another girl at his high school did die within 24 hours of each other after pills they thought were something else turned out to be laced with fentanyl. It has highlighted a growing problem, not only in our area, but nationwide. Good evening and thanks for staying with us. I'm Deborah Knapp. And I'm Rank Gasway in for Steve Dunn. Tonight, the teen's parents are speaking to K2 in hopes of creating real change in the name of their 16-year-old son. K2's Kelly Ozer is live in Northeast Portland outside McDaniel High School where the teen was a student. Kelly, what does his mother want to see? I think it's what so many of us want to see. We want to see those counterfeit pills off of the street. And further than that, she says she wants whoever sold these to her child to be held accountable. What she says she doesn't want is for her son just to be another cautionary tale. The memories are all around her. You have to get out of this house. Like, you know, we can't keep living in this house. Um, that's too painful. Carrie Cohen's son, Griffin Hoffman, just turned 16 in February. Less than a month later, Carrie and her family are planning his funeral. He didn't want to die. And that's something that kills me. He didn't want to die. But on March 7th, Griffin took a pill he thought was Percocet. Carrie says she's learned it looked identical to Percocet, but instead it was a counterfeit pill laced with fentanyl. I just want to keep my son alive in every way in, in my life, in my heart, and the people who loved him. And um, um, I want him not to have died for nothing, but, you know, he did. I mean, it was pointless. His death is felt far beyond his immediate family. Outside the tennis courts at McDaniel High School, where he was a talented tennis player on the varsity team, a show of love for the young teen, showing how truly missed he is, a growing memorial with messages like, we miss your laughter every day. Now Carrie is sharing her son's story, hoping for some concrete change. And so her son's death wasn't pointless. Well, obviously, the thing I want most, of course, can't happen. I guess the best scenario is that we find we find this whole drug trade where this is happening. She says her hope when people hear this story is they realize he was no different from many other teens. He was just a kid, you know, I mean, I feel like that's kind of the most important thing. Like, he's just a kid like anybody else's kid. And, you know, he was, I know that he knew that he was entirely loved by his parents. So today I reached out to the district attorney's office to find out where they are with this case and the case of the other teenager from here at McDaniel High School. They tell me it is under investigation, but wouldn't divulge any other information. I did ask whether or not they're looking to hold someone accountable for these pills like Carrie wishes, but I didn't get a response. Last week, McDaniel's principal posted a video on Instagram pleading with students to stay away from pills. He says anyone who wants help can get it. No questions asked. If you have these pills in your possession, please do not take them. Students, if you have these pills in your possession and you want to get rid of them, all you have to do is come down and talk to any administrator. We're going to take the pills from you. We will not be asking any questions. We won't be putting your name in any list or asking any, any additional information. And there are no school consequences for self-reporting and turning those pills in. He also said for any student who doesn't feel comfortable talking to an administrator, there are other options in the community where teens can dispose of pills. The number of people dying from overdose hit a record high in 2021. The latest CDC estimate yesterday showed more than 105,000 people were killed in the 12-month period ending October 2021. And tonight, in our Recover Northwest report, we're hearing from local EMTs who are using alternatives to opioids to try and curb the crisis. K2's Evan Schreiber reports. There's alarm on these ambulances about an alarming overdose death rate. The team at Metro West headquarters in Hillsborough is responding. They're pulling out all the tools in their kits amid a growing discussion of how they should treat pain. Oh God, we talk about it. Yes, we talk about it all the time. Yeah, we do. We have to. Spokesperson Jan Lee tells me their crews are carrying non-opioid pain medications to give the people they treat an alternative, an effort to combat an opioid epidemic that the CDC says has killed more than half a million people in the last 20 years. 
But they've opened up these alternatives at least over the last few years. There's probably been an increased awareness. Sean Wood is behind the wheel as mostly a supervisor running ambulance training and oversight. He says crews are now carrying several options in these rigs, including liquid Tylenol and liquid ibuprofen, plus Toradol and ketamine. They do still use opioid painkillers, though. They definitely serve a purpose, but, um, you know, for people that either are very sensitive to them based on, you know, past history of addiction or they maybe they have a family member, so they're very sensitive to it. Um, you know, we have alternatives to, to give them. We're already at 20 homicides for this year, 19 of which are gunshot victims. Portland is on pace to see more shootings and deaths this year than last. Today, the mayor, police chief, and many others came together to talk about the rising gun violence and what can be done. K2's Genevieve Rayom was on that call and joins us live now at City Hall. Genevieve? Yeah, right. About a dozen city leaders, Portland police officers, and community members gathered here inside City Hall today. Reporters still had to join that news conference virtually, but this is a huge step towards normalcy. A gathering in the heart of the city to address a problem plaguing Portland. Gun violence knows no boundaries. Less than three months into the year, Portland is averaging 29 shootings a week. The gun violence has been called a public health crisis, but many Portlanders see it as more. Mayor Wheeler declare a state of emergency. About a week ago, Sam Sachs with the group No Hate Zone asked Mayor Ted Wheeler to take additional power. This group wants immediate action, and it has a list of actionable items for the city to take. We've seen this call from the community to declare this an emergency. It's something that you've done with the homeless crisis. Why not do the same with gun violence? Uh, so the call was made in a press conference last week. We've reached out to those individuals. I look forward to meeting with them, picking their brains, hearing their thoughts, and we'll see what we can do with it. Do you foresee yourself declaring this an emergency? Is it anything that interests you? Um, it's certainly worth looking at. Declaring a state of emergency gives the mayor control of all bureaus. And I believe there probably are some opportunities for us to work more collaboratively. He says he's looking forward to meeting with No Hate Zone to discuss their asks. Sam Sachs with No Hate Zone doesn't want the mayor to wait to meet with him before declaring this an emergency. With nearly 30 shootings happening a week, that's about four per day. Time is precious. Sam says if the mayor sees any benefit in declaring this an emergency, even if it's just one thing, he wants him to do it immediately.